Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the study session of May 9th, 2023. Donna, can you do a roll call, please? Yes, I will. Council Member Bowden. Here. Council Member Sherman. Here. Council Member Gutierrez. Here. Marinesco. Here. Deputy Mayor Schmidt. Here. Council Member McDowell. Present. And Council Member Peterson. Here. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. Public Works Director Jay Harris has information for us about streets and sidewalk standards. Good evening, Council. Jay Harris, your Public Works Director. Uh, good to be with you this evening. It's a nice night out there. Um, street Improvement Standards uh, Policy Discussion. I met with you folks, it was about almost a year ago when I presented some things to you, some challenges that we're having, um, went to um, the Development Code Committee, what was the name? Did I get the name right? Close. Some review committee. I review yeah. committee. Had some extensive conversations with them um, about most of the infill street standards, not about the street standards for like a brand new subdivision or that sort of thing. And so um, great committee, got some things resolved with them. And I wanted to share uh, with you some ideas tonight and just sort of get a direction. So the goal is, is to um, take the design and construction standards that were uh, redone in 2019, and uh, especially the transportation section, chapter two, and um, come back to you folks with some amendments and uh, to be able to give uh, a developers, property owners, someone even building a house, um, subdivisions, apartment sites, commercial centers, some real good, um, solid transportation uh, code criteria with very limited gray. So as we jump into it here, you're going to see where some of the gray is. So I like this picture. I found that at the Historical Society, uh, the 1917 dirt road. So you guys, cars had problems back then. You'd have a mechanic with you for a reason, right? And then Goodyear tires, you had a good year if you didn't have a blowout, but you can see the roads were just, just nasty. So we paved our first roadway in 26. And then in the 40s, Coda Street was uh, industry, hustling, uh, bustling, all sorts of active things there. Okay, hold on, I probably have to switch this on. There it goes. Okay, so um, our uh, street standards, uh, there's some reference documents. Um, so we have the City of Shelton Comprehensive Plan that was done in 2017. That has a transportation element part of it. The Municipal Code has uh, street standards or section in there also. International Fire Code, which uh, you folks adopted, what, a year and a half ago? Something like that? The 2018 has been two years. Well, yeah, it's delayed for COVID. So, yeah, we were out about a year and a half. Uh, anyways, it has some things about street widths and that sort of thing I'll get into. Um, Department of Ecology Stormwater Manual 2019 has a play because we're creating impervious services streets, right? And then the design and construction standards is where uh, some of the larger changes are proposed. Yeah. Uh, here, do you want to see if you can figure out what's going on here with this? Thanks. And is there a switch on it? It's just delayed. And really, it's, yeah, it's just the video that's delayed. My okay. screen changes I'll, a lot faster than that. Okay, I'll just point um, <laughs> or raise my hand or do something, wink my eye. Um, so the comprehensive plan is the first thing. A lot of text here. But anyways, the first part is, is the functional uh, classification system. And I'll show you what those are, arterial collectors, local streets, uh, pedestrian and bike facilities. Um, what this had in the comprehensive plan is we're to develop a sidewalk prioritization plan for the existing network and expansion, okay? That's one of the things we're talking about tonight is what is that prioritization plan, okay? I think that's important, and I got some, some good ideas for that. Um, and then uh, standards uh, for commercial development, um, install sidewalks. So mostly the prioritization plan will be for residential uh, infill. Um, and uh, new sub subdivisions are to install sidewalks. So again, we're talking about residential existing infill, not new subdivisions. 
And then um, we're also, Public Works is to develop a complete streets policy that has a vision to the community um, that accommodates all users, as pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, passengers, all ages, abilities, trucks, buses, all that sort of thing. So um, with some of the changes that we're talking about tonight, we're gonna go a long ways to complete streets. We still need to actually do the complete streets, but the design standards that I'm showing you, and these come from metro areas, you know, bigger metro areas, incorporate a lot of street, this uh, complete street policies in there. So um, anyways, if you're looking at transportation demand, demand modeling strategy, what this is, is trying to switch people from signal occupancy vehicles to transit carpools, vans, that sort of thing. Okay, it's a great thing to talk about. It's hard to get people to switch though. But every time you can get two or three people on a car, that's a couple less cars on the road, right? Um, and then also to go from non-motorized modes and go to bicycle and walking um, and then change the time of day. Everyone doesn't need to work at eight and get off at five, you know, stagger these times. And it's huge in the transportation system. Like if schools change by a half hour, some of the times they let out, especially if like multiple high schools, that's a problem or multiple elementary schools that are in the near vicinity, you can cause a lot of problems. I know they like to keep things on schedules, but when you release a bunch of people all at once, that's a problem. So changing the time is, is important. And um, then also uh, just changing the way we do things, compress our work week, that can be foot four tens, that can be consolidating your errands. When you go out for an errand, go do five things, right? Uh, anyways, or just uh, dial in Amazon, right? With the drone, they'll be here soon. Um, call people and then uh, shared access and commercial dis districts. What that is, is don't build a Fred Myers that doesn't connect the parking lot over to Walmart or to other uses. So those people don't have to go out to the main arterial or roadway to go and turn back in and go get a pizza, right? That all the strip malls and stuff are connected by internal roadways. So that's what that is. Transportation land use um, that... Uh, you want to have new development and redevelopment to incorporate transit, pedestrian, and non-motorized supportive measures proportionate to their scale of development. And you do this during the development review process. And there's measures in there, the sidewalks, the pathways. You want to minimize walking distances between buildings and streets. Um, you want to preserve and connect the whole pedestrian and bicycle grid system traffic calming measures, that makes a lot of sense, right? And, and that could just be a little narrower streets. Residential streets, they're a little narrower. And if there's two cars passing, you gotta slow down and maybe go weave over into someone's driveway while someone's sort of going the other way. There's nothing wrong with that, right? And uh, we're talking maybe small traffic circles, larger traffic circles, um, that sort of thing. And you'll see in a bit, uh, even planted medians with street trees and street trees on both sides to eliminate that view corridor where you can see a half mile up the road that encourages speeding, right? So uh, promote shared access again and uh, design transit access into new developments, which makes sense. And so we bring in uh, transit folks for the new stop. So the Peacock Ridges, the Coffee Creeks, during development review, we need to be adding uh, those type of transit stops, you know, for neighborhoods so they can pick up people. Um, and then we want to make sure there's convenient access from arterials to residential neighborhoods, to employment and retail centers, and major uh, community and government uh, facilities. And so... Um, so we need to improve property that you can conveniently access from the street or with a walkway or a trail, right? So that's like the entrance to this building, very common sense type of measures that you don't walk down circuitous ways and that sort of thing from a parking lot. Um, no half streets, uh, no non-extendable dead end streets. Sometimes topography requires a cul-de-sac or a dead end street, but we want to build more through streets because what happens is, is a through street that connects to another through street can sometimes eliminate, you know, a couple blocks of out, out of, out of travel where you have to go around because it's a dead end and, you know, to get out of the neighborhood. 
So that's important. And that grid system is part of that. And then um, excessively large blocks and long local streets. Right now, we don't have a block criteria in our standards manual, and I'd like to implement something like that. So if you think of a residential neighborhood, how many houses do you put in a row to standard single family until there's a street? right? And the street somewhat grids you around. And typically, you have a block length of a couple thousand feet, you know, something like that. Normal type of numbers where you don't go tremendously long distances. And uh, that allows a lot of people to use different streets to get in and out. So the functional classification map, the freeway that is in ours, uh, there's arterials, collectors, uh, minor arterials, minor collectors, and uh, there's new and existing there. Um, this map doesn't show the local streets. Those are sort of the, the infill streets. Next slide. So here's an example. There's 101, that's the freeway. Principal arterial, you typically want limited access, okay? Um, and so examples of that are Highway 3, Railroad Avenue is one of them. A lot of things going on where there's parking, there's people backing out you know, from their houses and that sort of thing. You want to try to discourage some of that on your arterial streets because that's for transmission. That's to get people from A to B, right? Not necessarily for a car backing out and people waiting or someone trying to left turn into their driveway and people are waiting, right? We want to start protecting these. So um, I'd be recommending some access spacing standards for as we move forward to try to minimize driveway cuts and to consolidate things and just bring in people other ways, right? So a uh, minor arterial, that's a uh, moderate uh, ADT, that's uh, average daily traffic and uh, limited access on those. So that's Brockdale and 13th is shown there. Arcadia Johnsbury Road, um, the major collector um, that has a little bit more access, moderate average daily traffic again. That's Lake Boulevard, Turner, Northcliffe is shown here, um, Shelton Springs Road. Minor collector, that's getting down there where the ADT, that's the number of cars that go down that might be. 2000 a day, that sort of thing, 2,500. Um, whereas a local street, you want to try to keep those numbers well under a thousand if you can, because you have a livability thing. People, if you have a lot of traffic on your local streets and that's where you cut your blocks up, so people have a lot of ways to get in and out, it just makes your street a lot more livable. So critical pedestrian routes, this is in the current manual. Um, Public Works is cu currently looking at that as one of the goals that we had um, in the transportation comp plan is to look at where are our critical pedestrian routes. These are the main routes where we're moving people. Typically, those are a wider walk on one side of the road, um, eight foot minimum, usually want to be 10 or 12, especially if you have people walking both ways and maybe a guy going on a bike or something. Okay, you've, and this is a good example where you get them separated from the road. Typically, you don't go curb tight. You give some vegetation between the user. And so you get runners and walkers and all sorts of things on these type of routes. So the goal is, is to take new development and any future infill development onto these backbones, right? Um, one thing that isn't shown on here is the railroad trail right now, the Simpson Railroad Trail. Um, that needs to be shown as sort of a spine that's running as a diagonal. And I think that will be a really good add to this network. So if I live on Capitol Hill, for example, I should be able to walk and get onto a pedestrian path within a block or two of my house, a couple blocks, right? You're going to be walking down the road in some neighborhoods forever, most likely, right? In some neighborhoods where a lot of people have already built, right? There's no sidewalks at all. And there's really low, low, low traffic, right? That is likely you're going to be going to one of these critical routes. And that's sort of what we're going to get on some of those. For where there's infill that's going to happen, though, in the future, a lot of undeveloped lots, I think we change the paradigm and get those sidewalks to the critical pedestrian routes. So there's some of this weighing that, that we need to, to uh, get here. Next slide. So in the Shelton Municipal Code, 
what that was set up for was a frontage improvement charge. So the city was going to collect a fee in lieu of, of building the half street. So if you had a road in front of your house, that there was supposed to be a fee set for that, and um, that that money would go into the city, you'd pay for a sidewalk, you'd pay for some paving, and that charge would go into a fund, the city would add it up and go complete some of these infill neighborhoods and streets, okay? It was a great idea, but the fee was adopted at zero, okay? So we had a standard in place where you don't really have to build anything for infill, assuming that you're gonna have to pay a fee well, you have a lower standard and the fee was adopted at zero. So it's a sort of double whammy, especially in, in staffs trying to explain this to somebody, right? Well, sorry, um, was the fee adopted at zero or was it reduced to zero during that whole, we're gonna reduce fees to zero to spark building thing? Yeah, yeah so, so it wasn't adopted at nothing. It was dropped to zero. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't here at that time. It is currently set at zero, I guess yeah. is the better statement to make. Okay. Thank you. And so that sort of plays into what we're talking about here, because I think there's instances where we probably should collect a fee in lieu of for an infill lot to improve. That could be, we can consider a sidewalk fee, we can consider a road fee. And there's some instances where you have one house left, okay, and they build the half street improvement, right? And it's probably better for them just to pay a fee for the half street improvement. And then we probably combine that with other funds and go finish it for somebody else somewhere else. There's some neighborhoods that are far enough along that I don't think we can go in and save it. So there needs to be, unfortunately, either staff discretion off of some basic matrix, right? Where I can tell somebody what, what you're gonna do. Am I collecting a fee? OK, or am I having you build a half street improvement with sidewalk and a street tree or or that sort of thing? And again, I'm just talking about infill lots only. It's the whole discussion tends to revolve around lots of record. They're already laying there, but there's no street in front. So those come in a couple of different flavors. Um, one, we have a bunch of lots where there's no road at all. Right. <laughs> so without any road at all, if I'm in the middle of a block, OK, I can say you got to build a half street improvement in front of your house. What do you do after that? And you still got to build a road to get in and out. Right. I, I will share that with you in a minute. That's probably one of the worst case. The other is, is when you have an infill lot on a street like this. Right. Are you going to require a sidewalk, a curb, uh, a paid parking? And if, if you look at the way we did parking here at the gravel areas, they're pretty much unmaintained. Uh, public works doesn't maintain them. We maintain the actual pavement surface. We don't go and grade these gravel areas for folks because there's a lot of them, right? And so some are maintained, some are not. In this particular instance, they have a sidewalk in front of their house and the car is parked on it, right? So putting curbing in has a lot of benefits. It keeps the car off of the sidewalk. And if you have a landscape planter, it keeps them out of the planter. Likely, likely with stormwater requirements, that planter is going to be a drainage ditch or a swale in there also. And uh, it uh, also keeps the drainage on the street. Okay, the streets generate water, right? That water right now can sometimes, especially when the street starts getting rutted and worn, it starts running and it can start going in places where you don't want to. And that causes a, a nightmare for, for Brent. So curbing does a lot of things because you have inlets in very predefined locations. Okay. Uh, yes. You talked about a house that has no street in front of it. Yep. So I'm thinking, would that one of them be down Coda Street where they got the creek and then you've got a house and then the road comes this way? So there's on, no- uh, On that part of Coda? Uh-huh. Yeah, so there could be where there is no street. The right of way exists, but no street was ever built. So there's a lot with a bunch of trees in their front yard. For example, the top of Turner, you know, on the between Turner and Seventh on the on the corner up there, yeah. it, it's wooded property, oh. but it's platted. It was platted in the 1890s. 1890s. So there's lots and there's streets in those plats. They just never been opened up, never been developed. We don't have a gravel road, we don't have a paved road, we don't have any houses, but the blocks and lots are existing <clears throat> for the plat. Has anyone so ever inquired about those lots? Certainly. All the time. And what? Yeah. 
So that that's part of the discussion. Is it is yeah. it is it already a platted unopened right away? If it's unopened, there's no access provided through it. Is it an unimproved right away, which is not paved? It might be opened up, but it's just gravel, correct? Dirt or gravel? Yeah, 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 exactly right. So those are those are things that were addressed. Or is it maybe a substandard or you know partially improved where you have a a paved road and a gravel shoulder, maybe not great sidewalk, maybe no sidewalk. Um, we have all levels of these of these fringe improvements. It gets a little centers. complex. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's part of the issue here tonight. We're, we're dealing with so many variables, right? From from brand new construction, curb gutter sidewalk, full width improvements, down to an unopened right away in a platted in, in a platted section of town. Um, so, and we need to come up with standards that meet all of those criteria. And they're residential, so, right? Yeah. Um, you know, commercial zones are different. Right, because you don't know what's going to go in that commercial zone. It could be in some of our commercial zones, they allow some housing. Okay. And others, uh, I don't think I know that CRV, the valley zone, allows residential, but it could have allowed some commercial building also. There's some right? mixed so, use zoning in LIC and CRV, yeah. low, in low intensity um, commercial um, that's kind of on the back backside of the first blocks of Olympic Highway North, um, particularly, and then the CRV, which which uh, the, the, the mixed use zones bridge from more intensive uses, you know, like like our downtown zone where we are now. And those are downtowns with more intensive commercial uses. And so the mixed use zones bridge that between that intensive use to re residential use. So you tend to get a, mi a mixed mixture of what kind of development happens so there's it's multifamily, some single family residential, some some commercial development, but it's known that if you are living there and you're building residential, you know, in that area, that that zone allows for commercial development as well. So it's not it's known that it's not just a single family residential neighborhood. Gives some certainty to you know the developer and the property owners and the owners of the of the homes. So I'm going to go quicker on traffic impact fees. So the traffic impact fee is what you pay at when you pick up your building permit um, as your trips that you're adding to the system for like a single family home. The fee is currently at 5,000, Brent? 4,400. It's 4,400 a lot. So um, you pay that for your impact, your cars going into the system. And that could be a commercial development, single family, residential, whatever. But for us to properly take those arterials and collectors, we need to keep that fee in line so we can do a roundabout or a signal enhancement, a widening of a roadway, right? That's the traffic impact fees is to add capacity to the system. Just the same thing as with the water GFCs and the sewer GFCs. Those are our capacity charges that are important. Um, one thing I wanted to note that the impact fee um, is doesn't apply to any law before 1938. There it is, a number G up there. So infill development, um, any parcels created prior to 1938, um, if you use the original configuration of the subdivision without, you can move lot lines around, but you can't replat it, move a bunch of roads, do that sort of thing, that the traffic impact fee is waived uh, within that current standard, right? Um, and the reason I'm assuming for that, I wasn't here then, was to try to promote these infill developments to occur, these platted lots from the, you know, a lot more 1890s type of thing to develop. And to date, they really hadn't, right? I don't know how effective that policy was. And now we have, obviously, we have Coffee Creek, Bayview Estates, Peacock Ridge. Am I missing anything? Those are the big ones coming in that are actually brand new subdivisions that are paying the traffic impact fee. I just wanted to point that out. And the infill lots are still laying there for one reason or another. Uh, some of those have topographic challenges, though, in some areas. They get a little steep. Next slide. So the International Fire Code, this is a good slide here. So um, what this states is the road requirements. So if a road down at the bottom is 20 to 26 feet in width that um, you can't park on the street, okay? So if you're 26 feet 
more than 26 feet um, that you can, the signs are on one side. And if you're um, at 32 feet, you can park on both sides of the road. Okay, that's important because our local street standard in our book right now shows a local residential street at 40 feet. Okay, there's eight feet. And so that's eight feet is cost to the developer. Okay, it's also, and so we reduce our current standard by eight feet is what I'm recommending. Um, and also it's eight feet less I have to pay when I have to repave it or crack seal, street sweeping, and it goes on and on and on. So things like that are really good changes. Our standards are a little bloated, I guess I would say. Uh, next slide. But going back to the 20 to 26 feet, yeah. lane widths that that creates a problem for parking in residential neighborhoods right because when we do have parking in those it narrows that street down to one to lane. one lane yeah. and then it's an and then it's an issue for the residents of the neighborhood we get a lot of complaints about enforcement in those neighborhoods and it's also an issue for emergency vehicles so and garbage trucks i mean absolutely I mean, delivery there's, trucks there's, and all of those there's things, a good so. thing and bad thing about it i mean you have a narrower road the developer has to spend more money right less money yeah, absolutely yeah but if it's a wider road then it's yeah but long-term functionality we it's it, we've seen it proven in this community it doesn't work as in beverly heights i believe that that is one place especially if somebody has a party they have five vehicles in their house they have a boat they have an rv and things like that especially as we reduce lots to 4500 square feet there's less room for parking within those lots those those vehicles start moving out on the street. And if the street doesn't allow parking, right, because it's too narrow, it becomes an enforcement issue. And do right. we have the ability to enforce upon that with the staffing that we have at so one time? There's a lot of cities that have a matrix of um, if you're a single family house on this size of a lot, um, or how many bedrooms. How much on street parking do you need and how, how much off street parking? So um, this is a land use thing. So back in my design days, I used to have to show the car, where all the driveways are going to be. Because if you put your driveways in wrong, you'll chop up so you have no parking almost, especially on narrow robots. And so um, you need to show cars on the street and that sort of thing. And if they can't achieve that, either you have too many lots or you need to put in a parking lot somewhere and a private parking lot to house those vehicles for the, the two birthday parties on a Saturday or whatever that um, is quality of life for the people that live there, right? So there's some codes that have minimum on-street parking requirements, which is not a bad thing, but it is maybe a little onerous that we're telling the developer to not put in three car garages, right? And a little tiny house and another three car garage, and you only get one one spot on the street, right? Or little tiny narrow lots, you know, that there's driveways all over the place and there's no on street parking again. So something like that's probably warranted, you know, something to, to help guide these uh, a little bit better. I mean, there's some streets that are really going to be a problem. Sats up, the sats up the gravel road, that's very, very narrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, people would, to make that road for better sidewalks and paved, people would lose their, lose their yards completely. I mean, right. on that road. Yeah, that's like, why we're talking about a matrix, yeah. right? And this isn't a one size fit, fits all yeah. issue, right? We have so many variables in this community that we need to have a matrix that this 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 size of right away or this this form of development triggers this improvement. So we can have that flexibility. We can meet some of the existing development and also the future development that comes down the road. So it, like I said, it, it's it's a ball of wax a little bit, right? <laughs> and that's why we that's why we need to vet this and, and see what kind of what kind of variables the, the council wants to consider. And then we can build from there and, and come to you with some options and ideas that are gonna hopefully guide us and provide certainty to our development community too. One of the issues that we have is there there are some of these variables aren't clear. <laughs> these variables we're talking about, the matrix that we want to build isn't clear in here. So if Developer A comes to us at one side of town and we tell them what the standard may be. Developer B comes to us on the other side of town. It can be interpreted differently for our code right now. We really want some certainty within our standards and within our it's code. It's problematic for staff too. Absolutely. I mean, everybody should have the same answer, right? Right. So, yeah. <clears throat> well, how do we get there though? I mean, there's so many streets and so many different issues. I mean, how do we it's the start? It's I mean, just a start. Yeah, this, this is the start. It's going to take a little bit of time, but 
I mean, like so open conversation is going to help in that informing that, and it might take a couple of these meetings to get there, but we, we need to do that. Yeah, like you see on Capitol Hill, there's no way you're getting a sidewalk on San Joaquin. Is that what that street is that comes down? And the big, mm -hmm. so there's no sidewalk that would be there. But you got a hill on one side and a hill on the other. Without a significant retaining wall, you wouldn't be doing that project, but you do should get a pedestrian connection up there. Right. We could be talking about trails or separated paths or other other opportunities. Somehow to connecting to Peacock Ridge in the future. So at least they have one way to walk and get out and recreate. Right. So I would love not to walk up North Cliff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's a challenge to have it be rigid set guidelines for all of it because it doesn't fit every scenario. You have your historic or, areas. Yeah. You plus, we're talking areas. totally different things if you're talking an infill lot compared to a plant subdivision right. i mean because then you can control that plant subdivision this is what you have to do i mean it's almost got to be a case by case in places here in town when you're doing your infills the subdivisions are already set though they are yeah. required to do the works we're proposing a stand a street standard for for subdivisions yeah. yes that jay has talked about and i've got some they, things for yeah. in, some ideas yeah. for so, infill lots now there's a lot of cities that don't go through this pain. You just build a half street improvement, boy, and you wherever you build it, sidewalk, whatever, it's curb and gutter, and it could sit there for 20 years, 40 years, whatever. Eventually, though, as houses redevelop, and Lake Oswego has proven this, uh, the houses were getting ripped down. This is a higher end community, obviously, uh, but things do turn over over a significant amount of time. That's how other agencies resolve that. They just say this is standard. Everyone does it. I don't I wouldn't recommend that. I think we should be a little more flexible and try to plan these areas and the sidewalk connections and, and the street maybe a little better. But um, as you get up to Capitol Hill, there's gravel roads that exceed 15% right now. We have a hard time maintaining that gravel. The fire department doesn't even want to go up there, right? Roads like that need to be paved, right? So that type of thinking. Um, and with this, our definition of infill is going to change to, right now, the definition of infill, which you may see the vacant lot when the street is already developed, not our definition of infill. It's we need to work on that. So we're going to probably have several definitions of infill yeah. within it. I mean, we talked a few times over the years on infill, and that was basically where there was a house and it burned down or fell down or you know, there's a house here, no house here, and a house here. We called that an infill. I thought that's where we were. Yeah, we just have to define that. I think it's been in utilized part in different parts of our code for different purposes. So if it's for water connections, <clears throat> you know, infill, it has a different different uh, definition than maybe for street standards, too. And that provides some confusion for staff and for the development community, right? If this is consistency, this is <laughs> building certainty for um, all of us sitting uh, across the table from the development community and the development community coming in to the front counter and getting getting certainty and questions answered. I mean, in your opinions, like, I mean, I guess we shouldn't have it built on, right? I mean, our goal should be yeah. to have something built on every day. Yeah, it should already been lot, developed right? by now. So we should probably have code that's flexible enough to ensure that something can get built on that lot again someday. The most right. efficient use of property and the most efficient use of resources is, is density, right? right? We talked about that. We talked about their lot sizes, but um, it requires less extension of utilities, less extension of right. roadways and pedestrian facilities. If we can get that density further, saves everybody a little bit of time. Absolutely right, right. yes. Right. So uh, Department of Ecology, so we have our phase two permit, um, been under that for a few years, um, that uh, we want to make sure that our new street standards fit with the Department of Ecology, our phase two permit. So a lot of that is that vegetated planter strip. A lot of times you'll have an integrated swale like what you see there. You can see the curb cut out to let the water into it. Now, obviously, these pictures were taken on the perfect spring day, you know, like today. Those are nice. And I didn't enhance the colors on them either. But uh, anyways, you can see more of an urban downtown swale environment. Those are sedges and rushes. They're really hardy. And then um, that's more of a residential neighborhood. So um, we don't have street trees right now. We have a street tree corridor map. And so we only put street trees in on some of our major collectors and stuff. Um, my proposal would be adopting a street tree policy for the whole city where every new lot 
usually they're 30 to 35 feet on center. You put trees in and the benefit of trees is summertime shading of the roadway improvements that lowers the runoff temperature when you get those summer rains, right? Um, you can also uh, cool the existing houses nearby, depending on which way they're facing and all that, obviously. Um, the leaves capture and evaporate rain, tree roots uptake water, you get transpir transpiration, you get less runoff, right? Um, and then obviously carbon dioxide, uh, they help on that, a little bit of habitat in the trees. They actually help the streetscape though, is one of the bigger things. I asked the city manager, where is there a tree-lined street, a local street, where I can drive down and grab one of these pictures? And I tried to noodle it out. I couldn't figure it out. He couldn't think of one either. I don't think we have a tree-lined local street in this city yet. And I, I got some pictures in a section, the second that show um, what happens 20 years later when the trees grow up, grow together. They block out a lot of the houses and they make the street feel tight, it helps with traffic calming. Now there are some issues with trees, okay? Pushing up pavement, curb and sidewalk. And then also the leaves, they block inlets and that sort of thing. But I think there's far more benefits than there are detractions. You got that fancy new sweeper now. You got the fancy new <laughs> sweeper now. The mirrors go in. <laughs> it helps from McDowell. Yeah. Anyway, railroad is probably our closest to it tree line street yeah yeah that we in have corridor, corridor. in the residential yeah in the residential neighborhood we don't know we couldn't think of one at all yeah so the current engineering and design construction standards say that if you want to build a house right there on an existing lot of record you put in a gravel shoulder and you're done so um as an infill standard, that's what was set today. You were supposed to be paying that uh, frontage improvement charge, okay? It was at zero. So um, you build a rock shoulder onto whatever pavement is there, and you go build your house, and uh, you're done. If your lot uh, was before 1938, you wouldn't pay a traffic impact fee also. So, uh, can I have a yes. On that? So when you're talking about up there on Turner and those areas that you said were plotted way, way back then, and they're just straight now. Yep. Do those count as already grandfathered in? No, if they're a street where the roadway doesn't exist, we're making you put in full street standards. Okay. Yeah. But if there's a street that's navigable, which okay. is that's sort of it, but I mean, that's probably one of the worst yeah, cases. That, and that's part of the problem. This standard was adopted with an existing edge of pavement. If you see that detail, mm -hmm. it's assuming there's an edge of pavement there yeah. as well. And maybe it's assuming it's a suitable edge of pavement or a suitable width of pavement that, that wasn't fully vetted when this was adopted and the standard was adopted. So um, if, if you come in and put in your gravel shoulder, you may not have, you may not have suitable pavement out front. There may not be pavement at all. May not be pavement at all. So I thought, from a stormwater perspective, we weren't allowed to do this anymore. Like I thought, I thought we had to go down and control runoff. Like we were going to pay, repave, or rehabilitate a roadway. I thought we had to bring that up to current standards, which would be curb and gutter catch basins, and right. Yeah, if you're doing a pavement maintenance project, like a chip seal, no, no, I'm or talking crack seal. But if you're doing a, a full yeah. restoration of the roadway, you have to meet the stormwater standards if you exceed 2,000 square feet. Right. And there is some other things that release, the, if you have the matrix in front of you, the roadway projects is another category in there, and they give you a few other things. But basically, yeah, you got to meet the Department of Ecology Manual if you're, so if I'm taking this gravel road, so I'm looking first street at Otter, looking west, Okay, this is up on Capitol Hill up there. Um, that uh, it's Dave Killeran, right? Mm -hmm. It's a property owner along there. He's wanted to develop those. And at one time, people said, put in curb, gutter, sidewalk, half street improvement, all of that. Then that street's steeper than 15%. Uh, you know, so then the fire department came, came in and said, well, you need to pave it because he would want to just use that infill standard, right? And it's just like, everywhere you look, it's just something yeah. a little different on it. They're not triggering the stormwater because right now they don't have to do anything yeah. besides the gravel shoulder. So we wouldn't touch this then? 
Well, the fire department said you'd have to pave it because it's over 15%. But without that, without the fire department standard, without the IFC, the current standard is correct. You put a gravel shoulder you in and you're good. Gravel shoulder in and that's yeah. the building. <clears throat> so you're perpetuating the problems of gravel roads. Right. Gravel roads are a problem for us to maintain. Um, we're out there working on them all the time. And I mean, a goal would be in the next 50 years, there's no gravel roads or 20 years. That includes alleys too, right? That just down the road, we keep knocking them out where there's city staff or planned projects. It'd just be a good goal to say someday we're going to be all paved. Um, who was telling me about the bond measure? Was that you that was floated a couple been different here times? A couple bond measures. Yeah, yeah. and they never passed, but well, it'd still be a good goal, we'll right? Figure out our financial concerns that we're going to be going back to gravel roads. So we could be. You could be because once you get so. a, a exponential <laughs> potholes, yeah. it's easier for us to blade it when it's gravel, gravel with, with the, the, the scraper. Yeah. So it's a gravel shoulder. The gravel shoulders, what you see there on the left there, yeah. um, on, on Dickinson, oh, I see. That, that's a gravel, and it's just along, it's backing for the edge of the road so you can pull off. It also allows the offsite drainage to sort of infiltrate. Water won't run necessarily on the road as much. Okay. Where the yeah. issues too is, we got who pays for all this? Because I mean, yeah, it's a great plan, but like when you're trying to put it on, whoever's going to develop that, that lot, I mean, it's it's hard pressed that it's going to actually go all the way around it and connect through town when you're trying to put it on the homeowner or the developer, especially with the major thing I feel like we're talking about mainly these infill things. <clears throat> That's correct. So there's some streets that it doesn't even make sense because you couldn't do sidewalks down it because, like you said, it, it's going to be in someone's porch or mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah yeah. So each neighborhood is going to be looked at, and there's going to have to be some sort of little matrix put together that allows staff. And the development community a, a clear vision on exactly what you need. If to there's do. topographical features, say that prohibit you from uh, from putting that sidewalk in, it's not feasible. Yeah. It's not possible. Maybe not feasible, to, you know, but it's not yeah. possible. It's not physically possible. Then that would kick it into the right feet, right? So yeah. that we could get some of that infrastructure in in those along those critical pedestrian routes or something like that that would connect these portions of the city together. <clears throat> So uh, the top part of this slide, uh, we just need clear roadway standards. We need to follow what's in the municipal code, uh, what's because it's higher level than the design and construction standards typically. Um, we also uh, need to be consistent with the transportation comprehensive plan and the international fire code. Um, so we met with the development code update committee. I got the name right in here um, multiple times, and uh, it all revolved for the most part around infill neighborhoods, um, residential zone. So um, what they had stated at some of the indie meetings is that uh, infill development standards should only apply to the NR zone. And, um, and then there needs to be on these larger platted areas, some place where you just say, you know what, that if you have eight lots or four lots in a row or there's some amount, you're going to start putting in streets and sidewalks and that sort of thing. So if you have a 20 lot subdivision coming in, I mean, do you let them all build, you know, some interim improvement, right? When it's a 20 lot subdivision, it's already platted, but they were saying these larger paper subdivisions are a problem that there should be infill should apply to two houses where there's already five in a row and, and that sort of thing was their context of infill that it shouldn't be for a 60 lot pre-platted something from 1890s those should be full improvement standards is what they were saying um and that they shouldn't apply to other zones in the city as downtown or mixed use medical commercial that sort of thing and then they also recommended that um, if you're on the critical pedestrian route, that map that I showed earlier, that um, you, you need to construct the half street improvement and, and put in the sidewalk. They really thought that those networks, if you front it, you need to build that walk. So, cause those won't lead to anywhere, right? That eventually those, those are our priority. Those are the ones that need to be connecting up. So the thought was, is those get built and then in some areas where you're not on a critical pedestrian route, 
but you're nearby, that frontage improvement fee would apply. Where you pay a fee in lieu of for your sidewalk that you didn't build, it would go into the critical pedestrian route program and start funding that program so we get these routes to areas. So um, on this here, this talks about what your existing site frontage is, unimproved right away, a gravel road, a paved road, um, a corner lot, you know, what do you do? We have two streets, right? And an unimproved alley. And um, pretty much it was sort of the start of that matrix we were talking about, about how can I tell people what to do when? And so um, A1 uh, gets you to that magic 26 feet, okay? 26 feet, you can park on one side, right? So if you're doing a, a, a residential infill lot, if you can get 26 feet, you park on the one side in front of your house, which gets people off of gravel shoulders and that sort of thing. And uh, you might have to dedicate a little bit of right of way. If there's a house right on the right of way, that standard would have to get modified, obviously. I mean, the intent isn't to you know, take off people's porches and that sort of thing. So, um, if and if you're on the critical pedestrian route, um, that's the bottom side there that you'd be required to put in that little half street, and you have to build the sidewalk also. So, offsite access roads, that's at the bottom. So, I am one of those people, and in the middle of an, a platted subdivision, but there's no roads either way. Okay. And I want to go build three houses in there. I've owned them, my dad gave them to me, whatever, right? I need to put in a little half street improvement per, per one of these. Um, and uh, you also have to have a road to go in and out. So that's what that speaks of that um, on the next, if you go to the next slide, it shows uh, the roadway that you'd have to build. That's that 20 foot wide roadway, no parking on both sides. The fire department accepts that as an improvement. And so, you should probably wait until others get up to you, right? But if you, for one reason or another, were mid-block or you're by the end and there's three houses that you didn't own or three lots, this would allow you to build your subdivision. I got clear standards. This is how you get in and out. It's an interim roadway improvement. And then in the future, that diagram shows how people add on and get you the either 26 or the 32, which is parking on both sides, full roadway. Yes. Uh, two questions. I don't know what a half street improvement is. Yeah. What's, what's a half street? So that's why I don't own the other side. Okay? okay. I own one side of a roadway. Okay. I have to build what we call a half street improvement. We know if you have no parking on the road, I need to build 20 feet of pavement out there. Right. That's what the fire code tells me. Okay. And um, if you put in another six feet, that's your parking area, right? And so if you go to 26 on the half street improvement, so you're going over the center line of the road and building on the other side of center line, a little bit of the other side of the streets improvement, right? So uh, you're uh, to get 32 feet, which is the future per local roadway, you would be 16 and 16. So you would build a 10 plus your six foot parking. And then on the other side of the center line, another 10. Okay. Right. That way you have the 20 foot travel lane and the six foot parking area. Okay. Little tight, right? The fire code allows it, right? And there's some cities that go just a little wider than that, just to give a little more room you know, for people, um, that sort of thing. I took it down to what the, the fire code, you know, what their minimum is. If memory serves me right, when the TVD was passed, there was going to be some dedicated money for sidewalks as well. Is that, you remember that, Mike? What's that? When the TVD was passed, they were, they were going to dedicate money for sidewalks? I think we were going to talk about it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, next slide. So these are some of the definitions. So there's a definition that's current of what um, the word development is, and it's any man-made change to real property. And uh, that's construction of buildings, structures, additions, reconstructions, manufactured homes. You can mine, you can dredge, you can log, you can clear. So the way the code currently has is uh, a street standards apply if you're a mining operation, if you're just grading, if you're just clearing, 
but they don't say, what are you doing, right? What are you building? And so staff is really unclear about when you have the word development, but you don't have thresholds of when street improvements would be required. So down below um, is uh, one of the suggestions is um, to look at the word redevelopment, okay? And so um, what that is, is um, if you're an existing uh, use adjacent to a public right-of-way, you need to dedicate right-of-way of whatever width we need it. And then um, you need to construct or reconstruct some existing improvements. And, um, and they need to meet a standard that we still need to talk about what the standard is. So um, down there um, at the very bottom, there's a threshold. And so um, the threshold is um, the, it's assess valuation. So site redevelopment is defined as projects. And this is just a, a proposal, right? This isn't, we're not saying we're doing this. It's just to get the ideas going. So site redevelopment is defined as projects where there's a proposed on-site improvement that exceeds 50% of the existing pre-assessed value. So if you're doing a major improvement to a structure, it's a rip down, right? And you're adding a whole new structure, um, that sort of thing that um, street standards would apply. We also have, maybe there's a trip threshold in there also that, um, you know, if you, a residential house generates uh, what is it, nine and a half trips per day now, something like that, um, that if you exceed that eight trips per day, you would also need to go build some sort of frontage improvement. Um, we need to put more ropes on this. So obviously this is sort of, there's a valuation thing. There's a traffic thing, you know, in terms of trips per day. So like an ADU, if you added an ADU, it's under eight trips per day, right? And we were trying to look at all the different impacts it's likely this wouldn't apply to an industrial or commercial zone, right? This just might be for residential only to get some more ropes around it. So it, what would the, in the case of a house burns down on a gravel road and and they need to rebuild, all this kick in? Because I'm not sure their insurance company is going to pay for a road in front of their house. The way that is, but I think you would put something in there just saying that a replacement structure within five years, if you're wholly replacing a structure, something like that, so you can give an out in that sort of thing. So if yeah. you have a house on a piece of property and you take off part of the house to put a new addition on, but the new addition isn't really any bigger than what you took off, you have the same amount of people in the house, same amount of cars. Why? Why do you have to, I'm not clear on why that you would have to improve, well, improve the front end. It has to exceed the 50% of the value. So if you did an addition that like double the size of your house, that's what that's trying to encompass. Oh, okay. But well, if you just tore down a piece and put on a new piece, you probably aren't going to hit that 50% okay. threshold. All right. Uh, okay. And so the uh, that comes actually from the building code. Right, I'm not making this up. It's the uh, International Billing Code has that, and it's very specific. Uh, the words there, so we're already using it for tenant improvements, commercial houses, all of that as the building code goes. It's an opportunity to provide consistency, and so if if your structure, you know, if you had major renovations, your structural changes, or whatever else, and you exceed fifty percent of the valuation of the structure, not including the property, not including the land, then you need to meet existing. Code st okay. structure, and that's what the building code says. So it's some consistency for staff as well. Uh, and then traffic impact fee. Um, there needs to be the changes to the 1938. Maybe we set a certain number of lots in there. Maybe we eliminate that. Maybe we keep it, right? But what do we want to do for infill lots? Um, you know, when you look at, you know, there's hundreds of infill lots that are, the streets aren't built and all of that. Um, so they're adding traffic to the system. Yeah, they were platted a zillion years ago, but you have the coffee creeks and the Bayview Estates and all these other developments, you know, that are paying that traffic impact fee. So there's some inequity and maybe on some of the smaller infill, the one by one type of thing, I think there's maybe some more intent there to maybe encourage 
densification of existing neighborhoods, maybe something like that, and maybe do a little bit of work there on the traffic impact fee section. Because they will generate more trips when you build more houses that people will come, right? So, um, so the frontage improvement charge, um, one idea is if, in a matrix, if we waive the sidewalk and want to put that money to the critical pedestrian routes, the person would pay it the sidewalk fee that would show on the master fee schedule. Also, if there's a pavement improvement that need to be done or curbing, that would also be in the master fee schedule. So when we got through the matrix and we say, infill lot, have a good day, you don't need to go build anything, but you need to pay these in lieu of fees instead, right? Those would be in the master fee schedule is an, is an idea. And they'd be kept up with inflation and that sort of thing. Yeah, why, why not do that? Just why why ask them to do any improvements? Just collect the fee and then program the funding for improvements. Well, yeah, or for the sidewalk build out plan or whatever. Correct. I mean, that's an option. For the, build, that's an option. Trying to get people to build stuff because it seems like that's having a challenge, right? And I mean, the reason building yeah. challenges and whatnot. We have so, to build in engineering and, and yeah. everything else into that fee if we're going yeah. to if, if the city's going to yeah. So he's going to perform that project however many years later. Yeah. Um, and then we can do absolutely. the whole block at once or whatever. The, yeah. However that has its happen. And we're talking about infill, not peacock bridge. No, no, that's no, correct. Yeah. This is day just day. for yeah. infill. Yeah. I think, I guess we can clear that up now if everybody's on the same understanding that a new subdivision, yeah, right? Uh, the standards are, yeah. yeah, okay, good. Because I think that's, uh, the development review committee certainly agreed upon that. Uh, every every modern developer that is coming to the table now agrees that those are common uh, standards within uh, an urban environment. And uh, so, if we can if we can set that aside, right, and we can we can well, talk about the issue so at hand as, as as far as infill goes. So we're agreeing on the high standards for new development, the smaller lots that we can, the fewer cars, and the multimodal connectivity, all on new developments. It's the infill stuff that we're talking about now that we want to set straight. Collect some fees and try to get some cr critical pedestrian routes to these folks and yeah. then sort of call it the end, other right? Than, other than clarification, the, the, the standard itself, the, the design, the cross section needs some tweaking for for, yes. for subdivision. So that's still that, coming. I got a little it, list here of some proposed changes. So that, Good. That's, the, that's the discussion, I guess, is if, if that cross section is agreeable to the council. Um, um, what you I what you see? So, the new development should be yeah. in the high standards and the yeah. infill that we're discussing. Yeah. Yeah. And the various levels of infill. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's complex. Yeah. Why? Maybe to explain a little bit further. Maybe why my brain went right to just leave it as a fee um, versus you know, a project. Because mm -hmm. isn't that how TIF works? TIF, you're not paying. You're not paying for whatever traffic in front of you. You're paying for the impact to the entire city transportation That's network, right? So you're gonna renovate and rebuild and bring in more bodies into this new neighbor, you know, to this neighborhood, right? You're gonna bring in a new house in the neighborhood that didn't have one for a period of time. So you're gonna create an impact, you know, full level impact, whatever, three people per household, a couple cars, whatever that is, but you're gonna create an impact, um, but right out in front of your house. I mean, I don't know, it's, I think we get a bigger bang for the buck if, if it's yeah, if it's a fee that we can apply to the system as opposed to just right out in front of their or right in front of their neighborhood or whatever it is. I think if we can comprehensively put that together, then yeah, it's something we can definitely look at. Yeah. Plus, um, it stops those sidewalks to nowhere. Well, yeah, it's walking down the street and there's a sidewalk in front of one house, and it, there's not going to be one in front of the others for yeah. the next fifty plus years because they're newer homes or they're fully remodeled homes or or there's yeah. nothing there. Yeah, like look at Harvard. I mean, <laughs> where are we going to put the rest of the sidewalks? But there's one house with a sidewalk going up Harvard. <laughs> I don't know if Harvard's on that map, on the critical pedestrian route map, but that needs some really good thinking. Which side of the road are we going to do that? What happens on the other side of the road? A lot of times you'll see like a 10-foot multimodal path 
and then a little five foot sidewalk on the other side. So you can still walk in front of your house or that sort of thing. But we need to do some really good work on those pedestrian corridors yeah. and make sure that they're getting into those neighborhoods. And then when they're permitting, they'll pay a sidewalk fee, you know, to go help build those critical pedestrian routes, right? And then um, on the pavement though, it all depends on what's there, you know, what do we need? Where's the drainage? Yeah, that sort of thing. So there's some details that we really need to work out on the pavement part of it. You know, before we can say we'll just collect a fee for all pavement, I think we need to come back to you guys and talk to you a little more about that. Is there an either or situation? You can either put the sidewalk in or pay. Is that something you guys have done? Well, and that, that's kind of what it was set up for. Right. It's what I kind of felt like. But it would be set at zero. It's like, Everyone takes the zero. Right. So my my question with that is, <laughs> right, yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, why would I build, pay the money? But, but um, you can get in consistencies, right? So you could say, mm -hmm. um, no, I'm just going to pay the, the fee and not put it in. And then maybe your neighbor says, oh, I'm just going to put one in. And then later you guys want to put a sidewalk in or something and then they don't line up with that. Is that an issue to be concerned about? If the street standards change, like a local re road, right. where you say, here's the widths and all that, and if the sidewalk's in the wrong spot, it could cause a problem. Yeah. A lot of times you see curb tight sidewalk and then sidewalk with a planter, right? Well, that moves it five feet, mm -hmm. right? Then there's problems, you know, trying to connect those up. Well, and just like where I live, like there's a sidewalk in front of my house, but it doesn't match the one next to my house. So, you know, it's like off centered, totally different. It's almost like height. I mean, like all different things. It almost doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I'm wondering if an either or is maybe not always the best. I'm not sure. Like if I'm the home or the person building, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'll just pay the fist and build it. Right. But then my neighbor builds. And they go ahead and put the sidewalk in, and then later you can, and then you have to tie into it. I'm just trying to figure out how so that's maybe work. it's better to have just either no feet, you know, do it with the, have the builder build it and straight across. I mean, and, but they can't, but they don't own the neighbors too. You know what I mean? So if later down the road right. they use that feet and they put a sidewalk in front of the neighbor's house, but you already put a sidewalk in. Yeah. What's to say that they're going to match up? They're going to, you know, even look right. Uh, if we adopt uniform street standards right now with most of our local streets, they're going to be 32 feet wide. There's going to be about a six foot planter in there. We're pretty much setting the sidewalk location. Most cities are doing this, and these standards typically don't change down the road. It takes some survey work, right, Jay? And we'll establish that up front. We'll have we'll, the first section of sidewalk to go in, if that's the case, would essentially develop the boundary, right? That's correct. And, and you'd work from there. I, I think one of the critical points here is we receive calls of staff on a regular basis on why can't I have sidewalks? Why can't I have paved streets in my neighborhood? And these are built out neighborhoods, right? And the the current answer is well, <laughs> the city can't come back and do those later, right? We don't have the resources to do those specifically in, in residential areas. There's there's not the grant funds available for those. The TBD, you know, is is has so much money available to it. The TIF money has so much available to it. So if we get these questions on a regular basis and we need and we need to provide answers to our community on why this isn't happening. Um, and we need to be clear on when it could happen or if it's ever going to happen, right? They, they need to know, they need that clarity just as much as our development community um, and why they might have to have these urban infrastructure improvements in place in their neighborhood in front of their buildings. So the committee, uh, we spoke to them about the parking areas, gravel or paved. Um, they agreed with the paved parking areas that, you know, newer developments, this is just one of the things they talked about. Um, if you're on a critical pedestrian route, you build the sidewalk, and uh, if you're uh, in your frontage improvement, you need to pave that parking strip. The gravel is not highly maintainable, and so they felt that that was important. So you guys obviously choose different things. I'm just telling you the direction they were sort of giving us. Isn't that supposed to be maintained by the homeowner? The gravel is, yeah. yeah. And so that's a good segue. So uh, 
street State trees sidewalks, curbs, and sidewalks yeah. that uh, the current code uh, calls for you to maintain the sidewalk, the plant, uh, the planter strip, and street trees. Okay, and so uh, we're coming up with the street tree list. Uh, that's for a six foot wide width. Um, our details include root barriers too. That's really important to put those in. You have to guy and stake them, do that sort of thing. And uh, when you pick up a building permit, you'll have a street trees. You'll show it on your building plans of what are you choosing from the list and where, and then you need to plant it to that detail. Um, there's other ways to do that too, where we can take a feed for the tree and that a couple times a year, we plant them using a landscaper and we plant 40 or 50 of them a year. Um, the benefit to that program is we get them away from water meters and fire hydrants and street lights. We uh, buy better nursery stock. We guy and stake them better. We make sure the root barriers in properly and we hand the homeowner a watering bag and we plant them not during August, but you know during October. So I would, there's two different routes. A lot of, almost everybody goes with builder puts in the tree, city doesn't mess with it. We might want to talk more about a program where we put in street trees for folks. We would have to manage it. They'd have to pay a fee for the tree. We would have to figure out about how much that would be. And then two times a year, you don't plant them during the dead of the winter when it's freezing cold either. So what's the what's the weighing the cost of the homeowner doing it versus the city doing? You'd be the builder of the new house builder, that would do yes. it, correct? And so um, that uh, they typically would buy a, a tree wherever they get it off that list. It might not be the right caliber, but they'll put it in for $300 sort of thing. We'll be out there. The tree will die. There'll be no watering bag. Um, we require a bond for the tree also. And so then we have to get a hold of them and tell them to replant a new one. And then it goes in wrong and it's just you chase yourself constantly so it's easier for the city to char charge <clears throat> Twalton was at 500 i think i don't know what their fee is now but um anyways 500 600 for the tree and it goes in right and it's planted Twalton also had a surcharge on their fee of 50 dollars a tree over the cost and that would subsidize a tree, an infill tree for a fee program. So if you were missing a tree in front of your house for a hundred dollars back, this was some time ago, um, they would go plant a tree in front. At the same time, they'd go do your tree and hand you a watering bag and instructions and all that. So we allowed that program did more than just the builder. It also did other trees. So something really good to talk about. We need to adopt trees as a standard. And then the how I think is really important that we need to talk about how they go in in the future. So uh, next slide. I had a question, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so where it says the maintenance of right of way street, trees, sidewalks, road, blah, blah, blah. Um, so for the adjacent property owner. Okay, so a couple of questions with that. Let's say the sidewalk needs repair. Does the person who owns the property there fix the sidewalk then? Okay. Also, um, does that apply to uh, snow removal? It should. What happens if they don't? We need to have the tools to enforce on that if that's a is that direction some, the council Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Is that a, a second piece to this then? Because it's like in Spokane, it was. Yep. Who do I sue when I trip on that crack? Exactly. Right. It goes yep. to the property owner that might not be the deeper po deep pocket, yeah. and a lot of times we're we're also shown in that situation. There's some yeah. There's a case that will allow you to get right. it. Got the deeper pockets as long as you're one percent involved in your paint for it. Yeah. 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 And there's case laws both. If you can prove that the the damage was done yeah. via a third party or the property owner or something like that. Right, you have the ability to pass on that liability. That isn't always the case, especially with yeah. a lot of old infrastructure. Getting the trees in correct is that the majority of sidewalks get uplifted because of the street trees. And so get planting them right, planting the right variety. So um, so downtown, there's a whole different thing. Um, what are we doing with street trees, sidewalks, downtown? Okay, there's a discussion coming up in a couple of weeks where I'm going to talk about actually what we're physically doing for the bottom side there. Um, but other things we need to think about. 
And so the, the downtown boundaries, and I took this out of our code, um, are uh, west of Front Street, south of Cedar, east of 7th, and then the front of Dakota and uh, between 7th and Front. So um, anyways, that's the downtown area. And so um, that the street standards would apply downtown and um, it, they pretty much do already. That would be for infill development. These are all commercial at this point, right? For the most part. And um, that you have, you put on-street parking, which most downtown has on-street parking. So I don't think that's a problem. So um, something I wanted to think about here, though, is uh, the top picture there is Franklin Street. You can see it's cut up with trenches and that sort of thing. It's Portland cement concrete. And so a lot of downtown has PCC paving in it. And um, I think that's a great attribute for your downtown, right? And I'm just recommending, and we're losing it to asphalt. Right. So you get a developer or somebody that goes in, they take out a bunch of the concrete and they go back in. It could have been the city too. Right. But we've been losing concrete roadways downtown. So I want to just test the waters here to see if you wanted something that talks about what we do to preserve the existing concrete roadways. And then um, that they would get if 50% if of the block. Um, is already a concrete road and you're developing an asphalt section, it needs to go back to concrete again. Those sorts of policies, I'm just floating that out there. Also very common, if you go in and cut out a panel, the panels go to center line. They're like 12 feet wide. A lot of times they're 20 foot long. You know, maybe we can get down to 10, but you should put a significant piece of that full panel back in again. Okay. Because what happens with concrete is when you slice and dice it, the gaps open up, water starts getting in there, and it just it gets topsy turvy, as you've seen all over the place. So if it didn't get diced up, much better on maintaining the Portland cement concrete uh, longer into the future because it isn't a flexible pavement system like asphalt. So are, are concrete panels free floating or are they tied together? Uh, the panels uh, are tied together when you go do a patch, okay? When you're pouring them brand new, there's some cities that dial the center line. I think the existing are they are not. Correct? The existing streets are today. Yeah, they're, they're old. But what we'd like to do, if you guys are interested, is yes. develop some better concrete street standards if, if you're yes, interested, you okay? Yes. But if you want to continue, we'll, they'll all be asphalt down the road because it is a little cheaper, a little easier, but you don't get quite the look of that picture of Coda Street, you know, way back when, you know, that was all uh, potent cement concrete. So just wanted to test the waters there, see if we can get consensus. Um, downtown street trees, um, that the city will maintain them, okay? And um, if you're a new development where it's missing some trees or something, the 30 feet on center applies, right, about, and you have to move them because of meters and, and street lights and that sort of thing. Um, also, um, the grate. The grates are standard, right? You put in that grate until we change to something else. Um, I, I think you need to continue putting that in. And... Um, and then we're, our public works department is taking care of the sidewalks downtown and the street trees. We've already been doing it. We need to continue to do that. That needs to be clear in the code though. So we all know that we're trimming the trees, we're fixing any uplifted sidewalks. And I'll, I'll talk more in a couple of weeks about that a little more. So um, anyways, I didn't know if you're interested in that. And then these are the proposed design and construction standards. And so um, most of it is on the local residential side. So um, some of the big changes is um, we were thinking uh, that you might reduce the sidewalk. Uh, the current standard shows a six foot sidewalk, which is actually really nice on each side of the street for two way traffic. A kid on a little bike or a trike or something. A lot of cities have gone to five there. So that's something to consider. And then uh, the other one was to go from 40 feet down to uh, be 32 feet. So that was big. I, we think that's important. It shows 34 on here right now on this slide. We can go down to uh, 32 if, one, if we wanted to. Um, and then just some other fixes if you go to the next slide. Um, and um, 
this would be what they sort of, so the local streets would sort of look like the upper side there where you got street trees. You know, you could see maybe a little younger one there on the right that the property owners would own and maintain the tree, which means if the tree falls over or dies, whatever, you put in another tree, you know, so as we're issuing permits with subdivisions, those trees that are shown on those plans with that permit, it's just like the sidewalk, right? You're responsible for that. So that tree stays there forever, right? And so they will get replaced over time. So you have different varieties, different ages, that sort of thing. These are um, select Cleveland pears on the top there, or Chantelier pears is the other name for it. I just found out the same thing. I found that out today, um, which is good. for our, These are our downtown street trees. Um, these are probably 20 years old there. Um, you can also, if you want, off of the street tree list, um, some cities have defined uh, tree areas. You plant these two varieties in this area, those two over there, those four over there, whatever, right? And so you can take that street tree list and we can plant by zones if you want to, which actually is nice if you're driving around and you pick different ones that sort of complement each other rather than giving a list that people can select from. You're limited to your choices, perhaps, is another idea. It's sort of a, a little more urban planning, right? Uh, questions? Back to the sidewalks. I'm sorry. In my mind, and I need to ask. So you have a sidewalk in front of, you live in the city, you have a sidewalk in front of your house. Basically, the sidewalk belongs to the city, but the homeowner needs to maintain it. Sidewalk is in the public right of way. It's for public benefit, and the city maintains the public right of way. Okay, so it doesn't belong to the city. You actually owned a center line still. When we vacate right away, that goes back to the person it came from. So you actually own that. And so it, when they call right away, it's a glorified easement for pedestrian utilities, sewer, water, all those type of uses. But the underlying property still owns the center line. So what happens if someone falls on that sidewalk in front of my house and hurts themselves? Is the city responsible or is the homeowner? The property owner is first in line. Okay, so what about downtown in front of the businesses? We need to take care of these. You would take care of the those? The city is responsible for maintenance of the sidewalks downtown. In two weeks, we're going to have a significant okay. discussion about what are we doing and when. Okay, got it. So down on the bottom there, um, the major collector. Um, so you can see I'm proposing a little median in there. That's to break up the roadway. And so that median wouldn't be continuous necessarily. It might go for two, 300 feet, then have a break, a left turn pocket, and then it would start again, those sorts of things. Um, you do wanna have some breaks. And if there is an emergency, you know, cars can pull off a little bit, the rig can get beyond. Um, that's a roll curb there. So that people will sneak up onto it if they need to get by somebody. So we need to talk about, you know, our fire department here also. But um, it breaks up the linear look of a straight roadway. Peacock Ridge, for example, they got a long straight roadway going in there. Is that Alpine Way? That's Alpine Way. Of yeah. Alpine Way. Yeah. yeah, it's long and linear. And uh, it just, you get speeders, right? People can see a long ways and they tend to speed a little more. You also want all the benefits of street trees that I talked about earlier. Um, the detriments to a median on really busy roads. I don't want our maintenance folks out there. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit of a problem, a little bit of a double-edged sword. But I think for the community, um, this, I happen to be an Olympia or Lacey there. It to be designed right. correctly. Um, so they're low maintenance. You know, we have some yeah. medians now that have been turfed and it, it I mean, it's a maintenance issue, right? And they become unsightly because they're hard to maintain in those small areas. Um, and then if you don't, no have irrigation. Food, yeah, drought tolerant planning. planning they'll drought tolerant looking for some of our yeah. partners in this community to come up with a. So our next slide. So that's it, you guys. So that's sort of downtown, and that's Tolly over there. So. Um, I, you know, I just want to try to formulate some opinions so I can come back to you guys. And I think another one of these would be well warranted, right? Where I actually bring back standards, matrices, things to look at, right? Um, rather than a PowerPoint, we actually come back to you with proposed changes rather than, and then, then make some more tweaks to that. 
and then probably come back, you know, for council adoption after that would be my recommendation. We're hoping to connect some dots, right? This is the first dot in the, in the line here. And so connect those with, with your feedback tonight, refine these, come back, maybe reach back out to the development community too and get some get some comments from them. I know the government affairs committee may be interested as well. If there's any other stakeholders that really have um, you know, have have some passion about this and have an interest in here, want to be able to communicate with them as well. So I think we need to identify the streets. I mean, all the streets that can be upgraded and can't be upgraded. Um, houses on almost on the street or the gravel road is 12 feet wide. And what do you do? On, on, sats up is my mind. Well, I think I we, we can identify the situation, right? We might not have to go out yeah. and identify street A is is yeah. gravel, no sidewalk, you know, half built with, you know, houses, you know. Well, I think we can say if, you know, this typical street has this condition, then this would apply. Um, right. I, it would be a lot of work to go out and identify each street and the conditions that already exist. In our minds, we know the conditions that exist, right? And so we can have categories you know, of the, these street conditions, these these development conditions in place, and then the application. So, Some sort of major. Yeah, and we can come up for the next study session, we can come up with examples if that works for you. So we can say, you know, have a picture. This is street, whatever. I mean, B, I, and this is this current condition. This is what standard would apply at that point. I mean, up in the Mountain View neighborhood, there's not a sidewalk up there. Jefferson, Washington, K, J. Right. There's no sidewalks there at all. So that entire, what, you know. I think there's a few. There's a couple. I, uh, I walk it really, sometimes, but it's hitting men. They're sure. really wide. So you get right sure. with this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one's airplane. And, and so, the, again, that would be a, that would be a typical condition that we are seeing now. So if somebody went in and did an infill, what standard would apply to that? Would it be nothing? Would it be in lieu of fee? And so we'd, we'd bring that condition through that matrix. Yeah, I mean, I'm right? okay with the lieu of fee. I'm not crazy about an owner having to maintain a sidewalk though. I can't afford a town full of um, senior citizens. I can't imagine an 80 year old couple out shoveling snow. Well, but they can hire somebody. Well, you that's know, they're getting a thousand dollars a month each on social security. They yeah, can really hire somebody. That's, I don't know, any city in the state. That's our existing requirement. Yeah, yeah I know. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that's the expectation. Yeah. That hasn't changed. I don't think we're talking about changing that. Yeah. The thing that bothers me is that <clears throat> the sidewalk is in front of my house. The city basically owns it. But if someone falls on it, I have to pay their medical costs if they get hurt. So the public owns it not the city, and we're responsible to okay. operate and maintain okay. it. So all the public are in the shared category with each other. I'm getting it. I'm getting it right. And ultimately, the city would probably. Ultimately, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. If we have a claim on a sidewalk, I just say this out loud, but it comes through our risk management. And typically, you know, there's there's some sort of Claims process. settlement okay. claims process that, that happens in any, in any one of those cases depending on the conditions that in play at the time of the incident which behooves us to have strong policy and planning around it to prevent and, and have resources from, available and balls and mm -hmm. ankles and all that mm -hmm. yeah so and build them correctly and build them correctly, build them correctly. Build them which is why i was again i quickly jumped to the fee um, versus having them build things uh just because again then we have those unpeaceful locations um you guys can design something that makes more sense somewhere else potentially yeah right and and then that money goes towards a complete project versus piecemeal chunks of right. concrete inconsistency yeah mm -hmm. and, and that's again where i'm kind of at is find figure out the math on the fee and what that would equate to to cover the costs and you know our majority cover what would be 80 percent cover 80 percent of the costs or whatever our goal is um and then uh and then put put the bones together for that walkability plan or whatever you want to call it. Your well, active transportation plan is probably what it would be, something like that. And then, uh, and then I'm assuming too, there's ties to TIP funds and other grant funds that we probably have to have certain design criteria that meets that too. And is there any in in any research on that, like future grant opportunities? So, Jim, in the residential side of things, 
I'm not sure. I'm mostly all have to. Yeah, I'm just thinking like yeah. the because I'm thinking like 30 years ago you weren't planning for density and walkable communities, right? I mean, you were, exactly you were starting right. on that. We didn't have walking scores, <laughs> right? Right. And now, right now we now we're trying to catch back up to that, and now we're planning for density, right? Two houses where one house used to be, right? Smaller right. lot sizes, narrower streets because it's wider streets, faster traffic, it's more dangerous, especially if you're walking out the street and not on the sidewalk. So we have a lot more people per house. And if I'm a business owner, with Coda uh, Railroad Franklin, I kind of want slow moving traffic by my business probably, right? And that's so, why the road diet was part yeah. of downtown visioning plan. Yeah, so I'm good with the narrower street concepts. Uh, it's cheaper for pavement maintenance. It's, again, slows traffic, traffic calming. We've been doing a good job, I think, with that. Continuing to communicate to the public why we're doing it that way. And we're not making it more congested. Uh, we're trying to slow people down to be safer because it's not so great. So how many years ago or what was the basically the date when Shelton started putting sidewalks? Oh, it, it actually goes back in the code quite a ways. There's a provision in there in the sidewalk section. I didn't include it in the slide that says all adjacent properties shall install sidewalks. And then something about uh, the warrants of the city, if, if we warrant to say you needed to do so. So there was something that if I said, you need to put in a sidewalk or else we're going to put it in for you, it's way back. It goes way back. But it was hit and miss. It wasn't required is what you're asking. It was required if we said we thought you needed it because it's dangerous or something. You're on a corner or whatever. Right? People didn't really. I mean, it wasn't a big deal to have sidewalks many years ago, was it? Because I remember it's, my mom telling me about people walking down to church in the grocery stores from Northcliffe, and they just walked down the road, no sidewalks. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that was much lower traffic volumes at that time, yeah. right? Now you wouldn't dare, you know, walk along that You'll road. you by a mirror from the truck. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to lie. Like, yeah. that's, a, that's yeah. a problem. Yeah, and then these are the sidewalk thing has definitely been an issue for a bit. But if I'm not mistaken, didn't the Habitat Hour re spark this conversation? Mm -hmm. And have we talked about that? If we just has that, where, where, where did that one? It, that one doesn't lie in the residential zone. Okay. So that. Okay. So uh, it's still a problem road though, because when are you going to have a complete sidewalk from from one end to the other? I mean, fifty years. I mean, it's still it's, 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 it's still a problem road. Yeah, they're putting in three lots worth, right? And so yeah. that's somewhat significant. But I think to Mayor Nissen's point, sometimes even if it's a significant improvement, it may not make sense for the neighborhood or for the ultimate connectivity plan for the city. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of, I think, what you were trying yeah. to get at, right? And that's why we separate neighborhood residential out from mixed use and commercial and industrial zones, because it, it is, I don't know if we have enough time tonight to, to dive into that. If we want to separate that out a little bit, we certainly can do that, or we can go down that road. A little I just thought we were supposed to be, I thought we were going to be talking about that, because I mean, has a decision been made on what they're doing? Or are they just throwing in sidewalks now? They, yeah. they, is that what, is yes, that what that landed? They're the standard. Okay. Um, the apartment site down the road, I guess there was a bus service there. I would have thought the bus would have gone there, but um, they want to get kids from there. They're walking to school down the road every day, down park. And so, you know, when you go to these higher density zones, commercial, multifamily, you know, these are improvements that need to go in, you know, for safety. Well, that's one of the questions that I noted to myself here is with the safe routes to schools, and we've added some um, modern sidewalks and infrastructure in areas that traditionally have not had them being like around Evergreen School, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that do in terms of infill and the consistency of how that's applied within those residential areas? So that's a question I have about what that looks like. Yeah. I mean, if the infrastructure is already in place, what standard would be applied? Understand? Well, I mean, like, so let's say that there's, you know, we've put it in state routes to schools, so we now have brand new beautiful sidewalks in this area, but the rest of the neighborhood by our code would not require them to come up yeah. to that. Are we thinking about how those things tie in, right? Our, our road reading, our state routes to schools, yeah. all of those pieces so that as we're putting all these layers on top of each other, it, it's making sense. 
Yeah. And so the critical pedestrian route map is the key. Right. Which side of the road, where, what uses, parks, schools, right. churches, all that, and get that figured out on that route map. And where the crosswalks would be. Yeah. 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 How you get to it. You can see that. Yeah. That's yeah, right. It's it's a. <laughs> it, it starts going down a rabbit hole, right? Yeah. The other the other concept that was mentioned, and I think we need to probably so to answer your question, Jay, um, I can't answer if these are all acceptable. I need to do some reading and research on this. So yeah. uh, some more information I'm sure will come up. But um driveway cuts for commercial, um, you know, down the Olympic super highway. Um so that's gonna be something I'm sure that's gonna come up as a problem. Um, when we start to do that, but I agree with it. Um, it's, so that, that's the access species yeah, standards. Yeah. And as the average daily traffic increases, yeah. the spacing between driveways and consolidations of uses and all that increases uh, just to make it safer. They don't have cars coming in and out all over the place. Yeah, I just, I'm just we're going to need to get a good education on that, you know what that means. Because I know at some point we'll be hearing from developers about yeah. access to yeah. their project or whatever. Yeah. So a good one is it's the gas station on the corner and the driveway is right on the corner and it's on something like Olympic Highway or something, right? Where people are, you know, turning yeah. right into that, going through the intersection, turning right in, taking a left in from the other way. People shooting out, going in to try to get into a left turn lane or something crazy right on a local road maybe but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That, that was the first one that came oh, to mind yeah yeah happy geriatry starbucks and wendy's yeah. yeah city street back yeah. in there somewhere yep somebody like, ran right over the yeah, starbucks like sign that yeah. northeast circle that this so <clears> the martin way cluster anyways, i can give you guys standards that yeah. other people are using yes. are pretty and, and that's why improving these standards yes. is critical and having them in place and be able to point to them when we have this development community come across our desk and to our table, um, we're not trying to um, kind of, I don't know, we're not, we're, we're not just trying to design it at, at, on the fly. Yeah. We have a standard that's built, it's yeah. acceptable. And so um, with that though, you know, we set the driveway yeah. space and let's say it's 300 feet from driveway to driveway. There's also a modification process in there too, the access spacing modification where we allow under instances you know, to put maybe an interim driveway in that would be closed in the future when the guy next door develops, he gives a road, just like the comp plan said, you know, stub roads to other people in these commercial areas, and then your driveway's interim, it'd be closed in the future. Yeah, there's other ways, uh, the alleys, mm -hmm. I mean, side street loading, like, I think the dentist offices and some of those other offices, yeah. they move right in from the alleys. Yeah. 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 So I'm trying to fully capture all of your questions or any information that you need for us to move forward and bring this back to you. Um, it's a, it's a, I don't know, you know, it's a ball of wax. It really is. I mean, you're all listening to this today and, and hearing so many options from staff, it, it can be, you can see how confusing it is for everybody that's dealing with this. So I want to capture as much as I can tonight, any questions, anything, throw them at us tonight. We'll make sure and get them written down. We'll make sure and answer, try to answer these as best as we can and then get you uh, another iteration of this presentation. So uh, you can better see what it looks like <laughs> in, in any application. Uh, any form and and try to move forward so we can clarify this. I mean, in my 20 whatever years here, I know this has been discussed many, many, <laughs> many times. If I can do anything but get this thing to bed, I think um, it'll be a su success story, right? <laughs> right? I mean, and, and Brent's been here a long time too. And that's one thing I do kind of want to round back to, I think, 11. Um, this is a standard that is directly linked to that in the you know, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is so that there are handy. Mm -hmm. and this standard needs some severe modification yeah. to it. So, kind of while you're thinking of the little bit of residential areas, see what you, this standard also wants. To, yeah, it's based uh, on the standard, right? And, and, it, yeah. and it assumes you have a roof in front of your house also. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe that's the thing too. Is at what point though do you stop permitting stuff to be built in certain ways or certain areas? You know what I mean? I know that's like talking moratoriums on things, but I mean, at what point do you kind of say it's like you can't bring this up to current 
you can't permit this. I mean, I don't think you can not permit something, but no, um, you don't want a taking, but there's, I mean, there, there's always going to be the ability to permit um, in some way. Is it Time feasible? Is, is it feasible, feasible right? Yeah. For, for somebody, um, but is it infeasible for the city to, to take on that liability. Th that liability or that public infrastructure that might be built to, you know, to below standard? Which um, is why the code is very clear. Correct. Very under, very easily understood because then somebody putting money down on a project and, may not even may not even do it. And Jay's not going to be here forever. Brent's not going to be here forever. And we want the next person that comes in here at whatever capacity to be able to open up our standards and have yeah. a clear direction at any time. Um, and it's really important. It actually increases the development in your city over yeah. time because they know what the standards are. They yeah. know if I buy this or X, I'm going to have to do Y. I don't even need to look it up because that is their standard. Yeah. And it allows the development community to go on to auto, autopilot and they know a good property when they see it because they know what the standards are. Right now, they're all over the map. Yeah. And they know what their costs are. Yeah. So please, anything. Democracies up front and for certainty. And um, I'm also for the highest quality stuff we can get and the highest environmental standards we can have and the fewest cars and the, the, the densest population that we can bring up. So um, that's my and everything connected to beautiful parks and a beautiful walkway and beautiful trees. And that's my vision of the city so for, for the next 20 years. For clarification, you say fees up front. Are, are you saying to consider the in lieu of fee yes. over, over over the frontage development standard? Yes. Okay. And then that, because of what, what Joe had mentioned earlier, we can decide to do it all at once or um, just let it be. And do you... You're talking about infills, right? Yes. Okay. Infills. Yeah. 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 If, if we can concentrate on that right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's the so toughest subject. Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But the future development also, I just want the highest standards of all kinds. Or when we develop that, we make sure that um, the consumers aren't fitting the bill for what the builders bill. And well, we only pay for it once yeah. and not, not forever. Yeah. So, and to the, to the mayor's point, a a representation of the existing conditions that we are facing in the city. Does that help you kind of work through this decision making process? If you know that the you have this existing condition on uh, you know this street condition means this improvement, this street condition right. means so this the improvement. Matrix goes okay, A, no, B, yes. Okay. I, I keep thinking of uh, stormwater, you know, matrix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I don't, I don't know if I want to follow that one specifically, <laughs> but. But that might be what this yeah. is, right? This yeah. is an bad. No, I actually yeah. said bad. I don't think yeah. that's actually a bad idea. I mean, yeah. if it's not rigid, if A, plot it out, then B, you know, it, yeah, yeah, it's kind of yes, no. It's, it's a, what do they call those books? If, choose your own. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. And it would help us a lot too if you give us your definitions of what you guys would like infill to actually be. <laughs> well, I think I infill is what I've said already, and we've been saying it on and off for years. Is is where there's houses and there's no house in the middle. You know, not a short plat. Mark was talking to me about some short plat mm -hmm. somewhere the other day that they don't have to do any of this stuff because I don't remember the reason. It, the so, fringe improvements are T27 for a short plat. So you can you can take a parcel, break it up into four lots, and T27 is still the frontage mm -hmm. improvement. So you can have four fronting lots, you build four houses and T27 and gravel shoulder is, is is the current standard for that. You go over that and it's considered a subdivision. Anything more than right? four? Anything more than four current per our current code. You put in the five lots, you put in a full street improvement. Yeah. RCW, so RCW says you can consider short plots up to nine lots. Mm -hmm. And that certainly would be a nice way to go yeah. for, for the city. It provides more flexibility, but do we want potential of nine lots across a whole block essentially? Um, with no French improvements at all, that's that's consideration. So that, that wouldn't be an infill to me. Not, right. And that's what we're saying. Not yeah. Yeah. It's not an infill. Because literally right. right now, our code just says if you're planning before 1938 on the paper lot, okay. it doesn't say two lots in the middle. You know, so give us what you're wanting. Let's say to tie it to, right? Infill just to fill up our street. <laughs> I mean, as where where there's <laughs> empty lots, where, where empty lots where there's holes. I mean, not an entire street with an open right away. Yeah, but then yeah, 
that. You're talking about where there's existing utilities, essentially? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. right. Like it's Those going right by it, right? <laughs> yeah. So there's a house over here and there's a house over here and there's an empty lot in the middle. That, to me, is an infill. Or I could fill that in. Basically, I'm broke right. down there by Vanderwall's garage where the hotel burnt down. Yeah, it's an empty lot. Okay, that fills. I'm going to show my cards here for a minute, but I didn't even know what the hell infill meant until you guys started saying it. Mm. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Shoot me a definition. I always said fill in. <laughs> so that's so that's that's we we put, what yeah. 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 we're only saying it's a lot so, in a residential yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. Right? Correct. So. And I and I think it's very easy to say it's on an open right away, right? If there's a street there, whether it's a gravel street or paved street and whatever frontage improvements are there, yeah. right? It could be considered in the lot. If there's no street put in, it's not it's not an open right away. Right. Yeah, and I was always assuming it there once was a structure there that connected to our utility and that's in film there could have been burned uh, but burned down. yeah, yeah right, so, right uh, then, so yeah I, that I is guess. always the case right with what, whatever stores. you think okay. makes sense i guess i'll review that and we can we can come up with yeah, yeah. So, a, a, a little variable there like exactly what council member sherman said it's like oh okay. we have a row of houses on this on coda there's like several houses that are burned down or empty lots sure that's infill to me naturally um oh. i don't know about like on the peripheries where there's like nine lots that are platted <clears throat> yeah, so that to me that's that's almost new development right so but, but yeah but, it's, but it depends am i developing all nine of that or are nine people putting up a single family home because we yeah. can we're encompassing mm -hmm. developers like the developers are all these big deep pocket <clears throat> people you know you put up a single family home there and you get an extra 20 or thirty thousand dollars in cost that's substantial to a homeowner mm -hmm. when i'm building a hundred homes that's not as substantial because the, the scale of it's different. So it's, I mean, when we're talking three, four, six, nine lots, what, what are we talking about? Like it's totally, totally a, yeah. a planned master community is there's, there's just, it makes sense to do all of those things. You're, you're building two homes downtown. Your, your costs are very, very much affected by that. Your, your profit, or, or even if you're just building it to live in. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's, it certainly has different it, impacts for 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 single or couple houses or absolutely yeah absolutely right. There's there's different impacts to different we, developers, if you will. And we are capped at our sale prices in, in town too. We 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 can't. You're, you're not building homes and selling them for a million dollars downtown, but especially on an infill lot on a four thousand square foot lot. Like mm -hmm. so. Well, in the bring your point like that down there and build that's. If you're talking about neighborhood residential, that's not in that zone. Yeah. Not but we grandfathered that lot in. We actually pitched that when we sold that lot. And we told people that, hey, you should buy this and build a, uh, you know, a little apartment or something right here. And it's already had uh, services, and I think we yeah, just utility connection fees, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that one that one lot. But that's how I mean, we even sold it like that. We well, sold, you know, this is a great this city's lot on Neyland. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Behind how about Ritz. the behind the Ritz? Didn't that? That's what we're talking about. about. Well, I was talking about the other, the more or the the hotel, not the not the um, one in. Yeah, yeah, the brick yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that, that was the one I was talking about. about. Isn't it? Or that's that's CRV. 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 Yeah. CRV. Yeah. And so again, the CRV, you yeah. can have a multifamily on it. Right. You can yeah. you can do uh, you can do a multifamily within that zone. You can do single family as well, um, but you can do a multifamily. So just like the apartments on uh, Goldsboro um, on on Park, um, you can have an intensive multifamily unit within those zones. So mm -hmm. to consider what kind of impacts that has. I think you sold that property for like thirty grand. Correct. Thirty. Yeah, thirty five yep. grand. I think. Yeah. And then we're gonna do all this great idea. To so well, announced parking lot. It's not soon. It will be here a lot, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so we didn't and underwater. Please. We didn't talk about there's no um parking requirements downtown, correct? Or in downtown there's there's no parking requirements. So the zoning requirements for parking in the downtown zone, yeah, are, are zero. And and that's good. That's fine. Okay. I don't, I don't know how you would you have to prescribe parking. Spaces. You've got zero lot lines yeah. there. So it's pretty, unless you want to require a parking garage, you know, yeah. <laughs> development, yeah. something like that. Yeah, we, and, and we, we want pedestrian traffic downtown, right? We want people out of their cars. We want them to yep. park and walk down the street and visit their um, local businesses. And so I, I think that works downtown and parking, um, in my opinion, I'll state it. I might 
you know, I might be stepping on some toes here, but I don't think there's a parking problem downtown right yeah. now. I don't know. Uh, so if you want to be bad, you know, <laughs> 10 stalls down sort of thing. But I mean, someday, 50 years from now, it's likely there's going to be some sort of structure, that sort of thing. A lot of downtowns have like a core area parking district board and that type of complexity where the garage is run and maintained and all those sorts of things. <laughs> Building heights will help that too, though. Yes, absolutely. It's three stories. I'm not, I'm not doing a garage on the bottom. Correct. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Have we talked any more about raising the height level of buildings? You'll see that in the zoning code. Okay. Yep. Anything else as far as the residential and building? I just want to make a quick standards. comment on page 19 where it says major collector example, the one on the bottom. So I always picture snow removal. <laughs> And the one with the stuff in the middle makes it so much easier because then you're not pushing the snow necessarily in their driveway. You're just right down the middle. And so you actually still, you're not impeding their ability to get in and out of their driveways. So when you do developments, that's always kind of a nice thing. So you can just push the snow in the middle instead of, you know. I, I think we'd probably keep trees in there, but just keep ground cover and low vegetation. So right. the snow if, can get right. piled up in there. If you have big right. bushes in there, that's a problem. Right. right. So. But but having that middle area to push it to versus like if if a truck's going down the road now, it's gonna push it right up against a car and you're you know trying to get out of your driveway. That's an issue. So I love this for developments. Obviously, we're not gonna change it down, but I, I like that. Um I know that we don't have a major snow catastrophe issue very often. But um, being able to get in and out of your driveway is kind of a big deal. <laughs> so, Councillor Sherman, one other point here Sorry. on that is um, there's a lot of cities that just yellow stripe median the whole way. And there is a driveway for a yeah, quarter of a mile, point, right? Having that and middle. they just stripe off and there yeah. is no median right. there. It's just a striped yeah. lane. Right. This is more pavement you have to maintain. Right. You'll see that in some areas around the city right now. It's like yeah. there's no driveways. There's no reason yeah. for a double left turn lane when there's no right. movements at all. It's, so It's waste of space. I get that. An additional maintenance costs for us too so that beautifies the community right too. are you saying you don't want the medians in no i'm saying that the median in the middle makes it easier yeah. because you know sure. off to the right and off to the left here you've got you know potential driveways but right down that middle where you're separating maybe you know one way of traffic to the other when your your snow truck goes down the road you can push to the middle yeah. so you're not blocking everybody coming in out you're not you know, putting the snow up against the garbage cans so they can't be dumped, things like that. Stuff that the issues that we currently have because the way our town is already built from way back in the day. So um, for future reference, having that extra area for those kind of things is kind of nice. So one other thing in the future when these major collectors are developed, the, the median's going to go in probably most likely with the newer developments, right? So that access space requirement's going to kick in, where it's 500 feet to driveways. You're going to see houses backing this with fences, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of these instances. So you won't get, just like the picture here, you're not going to see a lot of access on these, I don't think, in the future. That people are going to be backing them, which creates another problem. Who's maintaining the fences? Who's maintaining the, the grass strip on the right mm -hmm. there, right? Who's doing all that, right? And so the yeah. code currently the requires the budding property owner, yeah. but the, the HOA is going to have to maintain that. Yeah. Set up on the HOAs at that point. We are 12 minutes. That's a lively discussion. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Appreciate good. that. That's good stuff. Good. good. Did you get everything you need? I'm not sure. Uh, I feel that same way. It's a lot of information. Yeah, we've got some information. We'll put it back together. I, I think the consensus was another study session's in line. We'll look at that date. We'll, we'll work internally and see how much time it'll take us to kind of refine this and get it together for you. But we want to make this, you know, we want to do it right. We want to make this last. So I'm willing to take time now, as much time as we need to make sure it's right and we have something that is... Um, stands the test of time, at least, you know, through maybe all of our durations here. <laughs> I, I, well, I, I think that a lot of it is great. I think we need to kind of slow down a little bit on talking about tree requirements and some of that stuff. Let's deal with, let's deal with this infill stuff. Let's, we've got our development or large development already taken care of. They have to do the full meal deal. But I mean, before we get crazy with trees and Everything else, I think we should slow down and let's work on the problem at hand. Well, we, we actually have to refine our cross sections for, for subdivisions. 
it, it's not the 30, 32 feet. So we're going no, to that, no, that's, no, that's we, have, we have to, we have to do that. And there's, there's that sounds fine. There's still a lot of problems within within our development standards. It's easier to have all of our street standards done and updated at once. Okay. We'd like to do this comprehensively. And rather than taking it to you in pieces, yeah. our recommendation yeah. is bring you the oh. whole thing, but have enough of these that when it comes to adoption time, you can say, oh yeah, that's what we talk about. Yeah, yeah and yeah, if, yeah, if yeah, you'll yeah. allow us to present it, and if you want to pull back on it, that's that's understandable, no problem. But if you allow us to present it as kind of a package, it'll it'll focus on the infill yeah. development because those are the biggest questions at hand. Yeah. But if you allow us to present that as a package, it's it, you know the street standards are a section of our development standards. And oh, we can so if we can bring this forward, we can have it adopted as a package if at all possible. It, it helps everybody, staff, public developers. I love, I'm excited to see more of the matrix. My mind's not fully okay. wrapped around it because. I understand the challenge to me is having a standard that gives you the flexibility to move within our different types of streets and things like that. Yeah. Like we've been talking about them. Yeah. So I'm not fully seeing your matrix, but I mean, I can't, your pop up book made a lot of sense to me. But I'm <laughs> so just, I could do this, or I could do this. Yeah. <laughs> so, Correct. Uh, and I think on a major pedestrian route, yes, going this way. Yeah. Uh, Bang, you're going this way, kind of thing. I'm just okay. not seeing it clearly, you know, but like, I, but I understand where you're going with it. I like street. it, but it gives you that flexibility yeah. to to fill those holes because we're filling holes. They're they're in wheels, yeah. but they're not all the same. I mean, Correct. so it's there's not just you can't just have a single prescription that this is what everyone does because it, it won't work. I think as Jay said, some cities have just said forget it then we're going to have one standard yeah. because that's the easiest thing to implement yeah. and everybody can understand this yeah. one step right years but they all does that fit whatever it is every right. hole it doesn't fit every it might for a new count for right. yeah. then we're just but, walking away from those laws new work has that standard and they're just as old as this yeah it, it's just they get to the point people where don't like it but it's sure easy for sound and yeah. and certainly we're not we're not suggesting that you know at all, but I think you can understand the frustration it gets to at a point where you start volleying back and forth, and pretty soon somebody just wants to hit, hit the ball out of the court and say, "We're done. Let's let's find a standard." And just, so you're yeah. tired of I mean, the what ifs, what if this, what if that? You just want to, yeah. I mean, we're going to get to that point to where we mm -hmm. have one standard. You know, we just want our city to look somewhat normal. We want to get rid of the houses that are falling down, and we want to. Uh, replace them with nice houses we want to encourage that um obviously it's not working what we're doing now because gfc's and and traffic impacts all that are, are waived on some of these infill lots or maybe uh, we don't know i guess and nobody's still <laughs> building on them. i mean um habitat told me early on i don't know if it's changed you guys have had more conversations with them that they might not develop those other two lots because they don't can't make it affordable so I don't know if they've changed that theory since, but you know they had three lots there, and they said, "Well, we're not going to build the other two. They actually need to reset out of one, and we're going to put their warehouse in their uh, like headquarters yeah. there, but they don't know if those mm -hmm. lots are big enough to do it." Yeah, but that's the kind of you know thing I'm thinking of is mm -hmm. so we can't we get to build now, and we want to add trees and. Add well, curb better and sidewalks and make them but make your vision of the community, make them, right? Yeah, we've talked about well, this a lot I, of times. I, I know, but if people rules. aren't doing it, yeah. then we're still going to have that vacant, empty lot that you know is becoming a, a tent city or yeah. or you know, garbage clutch or couches. <laughs> you know, that I mean, heck, even that little right away in Terrace Heights, I didn't even know it right away. There's a whole bunch of equipment on there that is, I mean, and I found it just the other day that belongs to the city or you know. There's this guy's tractor on there and you know, boat and <laughs> right. so we have a definition of infill yet because it's vacant. Sorry, because it's vacant. So I mean I want to know Brent. I, I, Brent, that's a great question. Like what's infill, Brent? I mean, I don't know. Um, well, I mean, yeah. so that that's yeah. that's what I have to deal with every day when yeah. I get an application is <laughs> I have that standard to give them and then our infill definition. But I, I I can picture out what you you guys are saying one or two. Yeah. My preconception was this very but little bit right now, out, but it's we have a definition yeah. that can say yes, you meet that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the yeah. our definition of infill right now. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so we're gonna change that definition of infill yeah. to yes. a couple of houses missing in the middle yeah. of a um, block 
that's already, already developed around it. Yeah. 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 And not that that 1938 code, code right? says that right now. And, and, and along that. with that, and that's why I'm trying to get your input is okay. So that one's that we're tying the waiving the traffic impact fees to because we want those to push the development. It's so we kind of got to give this uh very because now right in village, if you apply before 1938 on a paper lot, that's in that's in yeah. so it's not correlating to saying okay yeah. well I, do we need to make that definition and what all comes with it if, if you're wanting those developed and you're saying okay you develop on those lots you don't pay a traffic impact fee and you don't get frontage improvement and right now with those into lots it's you do frontage improvements you do up to the gutter and again, it's that consistency. So if we're using infill, it means different things in different places. It that creates like right. a huge burden on both sides mm -hmm. of that conversation. So I can imagine the frustration. Kind of putting a ring around that purpose and yes. kind of. Well, I think everybody is kind of in agreement. Yes, these infill, what we see as infill lots, we need to define that and say, and then figure out what we're doing in the situation. Yeah. A 1938 thing doesn't seem to make sense if it's actually. I, I believe that was because yeah. the traffic impact fees got waived because the, the, I don't even believe that standard was applied before 1938. I think everything after that started being traffic impact fee eligible or something along those lines. I think Jason's brought up in the zone. It has to be what, when they were platted and the rules that were made after that. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Appreciate your time tonight lively discussion which i hope we'd have um gives us some direction right yeah. and some goals to meet and provide this, the council more information moving forward so we can all make an informed decision so we're looking forward to that i want to think they can be dumped in the dumpsters on dump day <laughs> dumpsters on dump day is the question we can, we can, we can be we can address that offline yeah offline. yeah <laughs> i think we haven't we had our agenda for tonight all right oh i'm sorry we're done. All right. We're all done on this. Does the council have any new items for discussion? It's up there on Saturday. <laughs>